All right, let's talk about molecules with more than one stereogenic or chiral center. This molecule here, palytoxin, is one of the most uh, complex natural products to have been isolated. It's from a marine organism and it's highly toxic. This molecule actually has a lethal dose in 50% of a mouse population of only 50 nanograms per kilogram. So if you somehow manage to make a 100 kilogram mouse, it would only take 50 micrograms to kill that mouse. One of the reasons why palytoxin is such a complex structure is not only the number of atoms and the number of possible ways they could be connected in uh, different uh, configurational isomers, but also uh, the number of stereogenic centers or chiral centers of this molecule. There's 64 of them. So there's 64 positions with this, which this molecule could have an R or an S um, stereogenic center. And so that means there's many, many different three-dimensional arrangements of the atoms in this molecule. Now, as an aside, here's a molecule named mitotoxin, and it's so large and complex, it almost makes palytoxin look simple. It's a very highly cytotoxic compound as well, and it acts by activating calcium uh, permeable uh, cation channels and leads to um, an increase in the calcium ion levels in the cytosol. Uh, now back to uh, stereogenic centers though, every time we have a stereogenic center there's two different possibilities, there's R or S configuration. So when um, we have a molecule with more than one stereogenic center, for every stereogenic center there's two possibilities. So we can just multiply them uh, together every time we have a new stereogenic center. So for example, cholesterol is this molecule here, it has eight stereogenic or chiral centers and so theoretically there could be two to the n or two to the eighth stereoisomers of cholesterol because there's eight different positions in which there can be two possibilities so two to the eighth is 256 so there's a theoretical maximum of 256 different stereoisomers and yet nature only makes one stereoisomer of cholesterol and so if we go back to uh, palytoxin, it has 64 stereogenic centers. So 2 to the power of 64 tells you just how many different stereoisomers there could be of palytoxin. Now, when we have more than one stereogenic or chiral center uh, in a molecule, that means that we can have diastereomers. So diastereomers are a set of stereoisomers, so a different three-dimensional arrangement of the atoms in a molecule, where we're not talking about enantiomers, so we're not talking about mirror images that are non-superimposable. Diastereomers are actually different three-dimensional arrangements of atoms in a molecule where we have the same connectivity, but we, have, we do not have mirror images. So diastereomers contain two or more stereogenic centers, and they have different physical and chemical properties. And, um, and so that makes them quite, quite different from enantiomers in many ways. So if you look at the structure of 2-bromo, uh, 3-chlorobutane, the structure here, it has two stereogenic centers. So there's 2 to the power of 2, or four stereoisomers possible. So we can have the 2R3S, we can have the 2S3R, the 2R3R, and the 2S3S isomers. Now we can group those in terms of enantiomers. So the 2R3S is an enantiomer of the 2S3R. And likewise, the 2R3R is an enantiomer of the 2S3S. But if we compare the RS to the RR or the SS, those uh, relationships are between diastereomers. So here, between these, we've got uh, mirror image compounds. Here we've got mirror image compounds. But across here, we have molecules that are not mirror images of each other, but different three-dimensional arrangements. So they're diastereomers. Now, when we talk about diastereomers, we can also have meso compounds. So if we have, a, for example, 2,3-dibromobutane, uh, it has two chiral carbons. However, um, only one of those isomers uh, can actually have non-superposable mirror images because one of those isomers has a plane of symmetry. We know that compounds with a plane of symmetry cannot be chiral. So if we look at the possible isomers of 2,3-dibromobutane, uh, there's 2R3R and 2S3S, which are enantiomers of each other, like so. There's uh, their non-superimposable mirror images. 
But then if we look at the 2R3S, that molecule has a planar symmetry. So if we draw it like this, and we put the planar symmetry along here, we can see that one half of the molecule reflects the other half of the molecule, and therefore the molecule is achiral, or not chiral. Now if we draw the mirror image of this compound, and we make a model of that, we can actually get that model and twist it so that it superimposes on the molecule to the left there. So it's um, not a chiral molecule. And you can also think of this in terms of the fact that this stereogenic center um, is related to this one in the fact that both of them have the same uh, atoms or same sub substituents attached to them. And so if we spun the molecule around, the uh, two position could also be the three position because of the symmetry of the molecule. So 2S3R is really the same as uh, 2S3R. So we call this situation a meso compound. So an achiral molecule possessing two or more stereogenic centers that is not chiral is a meso compound. And they will always have a plane of symmetry uh, within them that leads to that lack of chirality. So compounds with two uh, chiral centers are quite common in nature, and they are present in things like ephedrine. So ephedrine is uh, abundant from plant sources, including the Chinese herbal uh, plant marquine, uh, which is known uh, as ephedra sinica. So uh, ephedrine is a very common biologically active molecule. And uh, related to ephedrine, there's another molecule. So this is ephedrine where we've got down hydroxyl group here and up amino group here. If we look at the molecule with up hydroxyl group and up amino group, that is pseudoephedrine. Um, and pseudoephedrine uh, used to be very readily available and was sold under the brand name Sudafed. Um, and it was commonly used to treat nasal congestion and, uh, you know, as part of cold and flu remedies. Um, so it acts as a decongestant. However, um, in Australia and in many other countries, it's now uh, getting much harder to obtain and certainly as an over-the-counter medicine because uh, it has a very closely related structure to an illegal drug. So pseudoephedrine is very closely related to the structure of methamphetamine. They just differ in that methamphetamine is lacking this hydroxyl group. So through chemistry, clandestine chemists can convert pseudoephedrine into methamphetamine and then sell it um, illegally uh, on the street. And here's a picture of uh, methamphetamine, which is otherwise known as a street drug as uh, crystal meth. And you can see when it crystallizes um, in these large shapes, um, it has that appearance that makes it look almost like um, water ice. And so another street name for this drug is, is ice. And so that is why in Australia and many other countries, pseudoephedrine has been um, very heavily uh, legislated and is much harder to obtain uh, for its decongestant properties. And cold and flu remedies now in Australia and many other countries now use other molecules as decongestants rather than pseudoephedrine. So it's quite often useful to be able to separate enantiomers from a racemic mixture. Remember, a, a racemic mixture is a 50-50 mixture of the uh, mirror image forms or the enantiomers of a chiral molecule. And uh, it's often the case that we will either isolate from nature or make in the lab a racemic mixture and we want just one enantiomer or the other. Um, separating enantiomers is difficult. It can be done in a number of ways, but it's quite difficult. However, separating diastereomers is relatively easy because diastereomers do not have the same properties, the same physical properties. So whereas enantiomers will have the same melting point, the same boiling point, they'll have the same solubility in achiral solvents and so on, um, diastereomers quite often will have different solubilities. And so you might be able to crystallize one out, separate it from the other. And so it's possible to actually convert enantiomers into diastereomers through chemical means, separate them, and then reconvert the diastereomers back into enantiomers. And this whole process is known as resolution. So this is a resolution of a racemic mixture into its enantiomers. It's really easily achieved if the enantiomers have functional groups that allow them to be uh, reactive with chiral molecules to make these diastereomers. It's very often the case that if they have a carboxylic acid or an amine, we do this through making salts 
through either deprotonating the carboxylic acid or by protonating the uh, amine. Now, one of the very first resolutions to have been done, or actually the first resolution, was conducted by Louis Pasteur, and it was of a salt of uh, tartaric acid. So tartaric acid is readily available from, from wine, and uh, it has two uh, stereogenic centers. And so there's a meso uh, isomer, and there's um, a chiral isomer that can be either uh, the RR or the SS form. And so um, Pasteur was able to separate the RR from the SS by actually crystallizing the molecule as the sodium ammonium tartrate salt and then separating the crystals of this. So this is a very unusual molecule in that it actually crystallizes as separate crystals of the two enantiomers. So one crystal will be only one enantiomer and another crystal will be only the other enantiomer. And because those crystals are made up of chiral molecules, the crystals actually look different under a microscope. So Pasteur was able, with a microscope and a pair of tweezers, he was able to separate one enantiomeric crystal from another enantiomeric crystal one by one into piles and then characterize them separately. And this is actually the exception to the rule. Normally, racemates will crystallize with each crystal have an equal amount of each enantiomer in it, and so you can't separate the crystals. But this particular compound is the exception. So just imagine how long it must have taken Pasteur to, with a microscope and a pair of tweezers, pluck out these enantiomeric crystals just based on this difference in how they look. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit more uh, understanding about chiral molecules, enantiomers, um, how to separate them, and what diastereomers are, and the fact that we can have meso compounds where we have chiral centers, more than one, but overall the molecule has a planar symmetry and is therefore a chiral. Okay, thanks for watching.